and Homo erectus would have been contemporary, roughly, of Homo habilis. There's an overlap there, you notice? Okay, so a difference in between erectus and habilis is a larger frontal lobe. That is, your frontal lobes give you foresight, concentration, and reasoning. Standard stool, tools and technology, like hand axe. Big game hunting, which implies language. Oh, let's kill that elephant. I'm going up against the elephant. No, that ain't going to work. <laughs> How do we trap an elephant without digging a pit? Uh, watch the lions do it. How do we get the elephant from the lions? Right? So if Habilis had fire, Erectus definitely had fire. And these imply extensive use of language and coordination. And again, focusing on the importance of the brain. What area specifically is the frontal lobe? Here, forehead. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, and then basically, like, the stronger species would have killed off the... Well, they're not humans. We, we should technically say hominids. Or like That's why I said, you know, within the reading, you know, hominids, pongids, etc., etc., right? Chimps and bonobos are genetically identical, but they're different critters, and they so exist at the same time. Could you, like, classify them as, like, a Neanderthal versus, like, a... Neanderthal was yet another critter, okay. only in Europe. Okay. That existed at the same time as Homo sapiens, there was even interbreeding. They died out. So there were no Neanderthals in Africa, but they were in Europe. So again, where is all this coming from? You know, it's like uh, Garden of Eden. I mean, if you use the big biblical accounts, uh, you know, more than 5,000 years ago in this framework, even if we say there's an African genesis, there's lots of critters being generated that coexist at the same time. Yes, go ahead. Okay, so if it all generated from Africa, and would that just mean that like stronger breeds of like humans are like procreating, and then like the weaker breeds are procreating too? Now, the use of the term stronger and weaker implies, and look, that's the language. That's why you're using it, right? So it'd probably be easier to think of it in terms of successful or not. Like more advanced. Yeah, it could be more advanced, and that, again, is our assumption that it's more advanced. Because, you know, if you, one could, uh, let's see, the Indigo Girls song, um, Prince of Darkness, no one can convince me we aren't gluttons for our doom. I mean, right. We've been at the brink of nuclear annihilation, et cetera, et cetera, because of our great brains, but we poison our drinking water. Is that intelligent? <laughs> but more advanced could mean more successful. If it, you're selecting for a brain, and remember, this is us saying this about the past, using the physical record and saying, oh, look at this brain size. And look at us. We have bigger brains, therefore we are more successful. Yeah, we could just say However, right, you know, then you also say, oh, well, men's brains are bigger than women's brains, so we're smarter. Uh, it doesn't help well, there's that. Maybe brain size, maybe size ain't everything. Maybe it's the interconnections inside the brain, which in women are more complicated physically more intercollection between the hemispheres. Physically, bigger physical connection. So, yes, all that's possible. So the only way to determine that is, okay, well, we're here now and we're looking back. Do we get practical time travel and make sure that we're not changing timelines if we go back? So it's possible. I'm just throwing that element of doubt because it, the, the jury's out. I mean, we've made these conclusions, mm -hmm. right? 
I'm, a, I'm willing to accept them, but I'm also noticing that it's kind of biasing towards me. Maybe that, it, you know, a scientist has to question, I might be wrong. Yeah. Well, they theorize, like, within, like, the next, like, generations that there will be two species of, like, humans. Yes. Because people, like, attracted people are attracted to other attracted people. Right. Attracted people. Right. So they, like, assume that there'll be another two species of humans. Yes. Or is it who so we've been conditioned to think of as there? Humans. There is that, like too. That, yeah. That's, like, people are, like, or if like-minded people don't have like intelligent children, if they ha are too intelligent people to teach their children versus two people that can't read, and are yes, does that, yes. Go, does that go as far to say that Asians and Americans are different? Well, the, that's again where we get in who into who's doing the defining and why, and does practical experience bear that out? There's. The reason I refer to science fiction a lot is because, you know, it poses these questions. There's ancient, uh, not ancient, but uh, old uh, episodes of the Twilight Zone that you can get online. And basically, you know, there's that whole question of, you know, what we consider a normal looking human, there's an episode where there's a normal looking woman who hasn't been surgically altered to the standard of beauty that everybody else is, and she feels she's, she's ugly. And there's a colony of what we consider normal looking humans where she's sent to because, oh, well, you're ugly, right? And everybody else says, <laughs> and they're the standard of beauty. So I mean, you know, Rod Serling was brilliant in terms of posing those questions. They're like, who determines what's beauty? Who determines what's in, what's intelligent? But then you can like there is no standard of beauty. Like you cannot define what beauty is other than what is attractive to the eye. Like without giving me an example, you cannot define what beauty is. With what's attractive to the eye is this would be like, whose eye? But yeah. like, I have I have the beholder, right? That's the old Greek term, the Greek uh, axiom, as it were. So what I mean is. If you were like an artist, you like you would be like in charge of like creating what is beautiful. But if you like for you to like teach me the standard of what is beauty, so I could define what beauty is, without using an example, you couldn't define. It. Right. Right. De yeah. Definitions require examples, and we have to be able to agree what. Oh, that is beautiful. I think it might have a good one. <laughs> Look, it, you know, I can understand, I mean, and, and that's kind of what, you know, we're, we're dealing with within, within the class, okay, standards of beauty, what is, what is beautiful to who, and why is it, and who, who's doing the defining, you know, I have beautiful kids, my kids are the most beautiful in the world. My granddaughter is cute. We tell her so. <laughs> but we tell all our grandchildren they're cute. You know, as a parent, those of you who are parents, you know, you don't play fri you don't pay favorites. Are so you? beauty can be taught. Beauty can be taught, yeah. All right, so Homo sapiens sapiens, us. Slight di genetic digression into Neanderthals in Europe. Neanderthals, even with smaller brain cases, still hunted, used fire, buried their dead. They're eventually supplanted by Homo sapiens out of Africa, despite interbreeding. Larger brain and body size, larger brain within our framework, gives rise to specialized tool, cooking, changes in jaw muscles, assumed development, spoken language over gestural languages. Ability to talk around opaque objects or over differences. So, for example, those of you who are parents have observed this. In psychology, we call it um, there's a stage when the baby recognizes that mom exists when mom is not in line of sight. It's a psychological stage. Right? 
developmental stage that we went through. So the ability to deal with language, you can talk over distances, not face to face. You can talk around objects and signal if you don't want to scare off game, attack in five seconds. Object permanence is the state. Child recognizes that an object or person exists when they don't have line of sight to them anymore. All right, so with language comes abstract thought, music, culture. So that time, you know, even though we, I say 100,000 years ago, it's probably now close, closer to a quarter of a million. So abstract thought, like what's beauty? Philosophy. Things that are not relevant to the present moment. And what's music? Silence in between the noise. <laughs> and yeah, what's noise and what's signal? I have this discussion with my daughter who's a DJ. You're not a musician. Turntable's not an instrument. Like that really flies over various fests, right? You're so old fashioned. No, oh, I'm just a musician. Great, you can sample a drum beat, but you can't tell me what 6-8 is. Hmm, you can sample a horn line, but you can't tell me who, it, who it's from. Or you might even know who it's from, but what key is it? Oh, that doesn't matter in sampling. It just sounds great. Okay, well, why does it sound great? Hmm. All right, so culture itself is based on memory. And memory, the, the, basically the evolution of writing gives you the ability to pass on knowledge uh, from person to person over time, over a, uh, beyond a particular person's lifetime. So if we define culture basically uh, at the very base level, uh, that which you need to survive. Not that everything in culture is led to be pro-survival, but at this level, at this time, culture is a collection of, uh, we'll use the term memes, basically a pattern that can be transmitted by language that's pro-survival. Yes? Um, so around this time, would this be like when people are starting to develop like religions and stuff? Yes. Because they have these abstract thoughts? Neanderthals, I mean, why do, you, why do you bury dead instead of let the animals eat them and the insects? So it's nasty? Yeah, it's nasty, right? True. But why would you care? You could just like leave a person when they die and walk away from them and go somewhere else. All right? Go ahead. Ah, okay. So spirit. All right. So the belief in an afterlife. Can you see the afterlife? Well, maybe they could. Maybe we can, I don't know. But the idea, the fact that Neanderthals buried their dead means that they're thinking that there's an afterlife, which means it's more than just what's here, which requires abstract thought. And abstract thought is, I can talk about stuff that ain't in this room. Yeah. You know your house is still there. See that the spirits aren't the body, Yeah. so they give the body back. Right. But, you know, again, you have to believe in an afterlife, or at least sanitation. Sanitation, why we buy, it, why it's six feet under? Okay, well, that was during plague times, the minimum safe distance for burying a body, so the body itself wouldn't be a vector, wild animals wouldn't dig it up. In case you were wondering where that standard came from, that's 
where it came from. Now, people do other forms of burial, too. Tibetans do sky burial, where they literally like, chop you up, mix your body with barley and millet, and the vultures come down and eat you. Gone. Stain on the rock. Native Americans had a burial scaffold, where you leave the person up and you know, let the body return to the sky or the elements or whatever. But the concept of you doing that because of an afterlife, which means you have to have a brain capacity to think that. There are other creatures that do that too. Elephants, okay? dolphins, whales. Yes? So could this be connected to Homo sapiens developing the frontal lobe and developing more of a third eye? That is what we think. The third eye construct is not from Western. It's basically older than that. But yes, frontal lobe. Okay, <coughs> abstract thought and the future. So, for example, when I was Googling on Homo erectus, and I, this came up from a Christian website, the power of naming and defining. So, what is it? Soup line. Hmm? Soup line. A soup line. Okay. Could be a chorus line too, but... Let me ask, it, ask that a different way. What do you see? So in film they talk about visual grammar. What is this saying? What's the world view? Here? Yeah. Evolution of humans, yep. Walking on a linear path. Mm-hmm. Changing color. Mm-hmm. More upright, civilized. Mm-hmm. Left to right. Okay, so this is a pangid. This is more hominid. What else? Tools. Who's more evolved, who's less evolved? Okay, left, more, less evolved, right, more evolved. Right? Yeah. Yeah, is that with the visual grammar, right? Because you have them standing taller, right? Are there any gaps? Is there a logical break? Yeah. Can you zoom out from it? Kind of like... Not in PowerPoint, no. But. I don't see how something like that, like, picked up tools and language and all that. Like, where did that happen? What? Yeah. <laughs> it's an animal. <laughs> right, right. It's, yes, it's an animal. And so there are animals, I mean, chimpanzees and bonobos use tools. Gorillas use tools. Uh, yeah, tool making isn't limited to humans. Well, we have tool making as far back as, you know, Erectus and Habilis. It's like an idea of, like, beyond future besides just food and stories and stuff, like, like religion and stuff. Yeah. Um, since I'll be uh, more explicit just to show you this. All right, so where do you think the geographic origin of the first three figures are on the left. Africa. Africa. And the one, two on the right? Europe. 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 Huh. <laughs> okay. But we're talking about evolution. Right? And this is a Christian website. No, that doesn't yeah. seem to go together. Okay. Doesn't seem to go together, but, you know, what is it saying about who's more evolved than who? Huh, okay. And at that website, that they do kind of have that notion. Hmm, 
Right? I mean, it seems like it's an innocuous image, but again, there is visual grammar. We teach about it as a discipline in film. Picture is worth a thousand words. So, I mean, if you look at the picture, all right, that's, oh, that's a worldview, right? We know that these three, the first three are from Africa, so this is the difference between this guy and this guy. His kind of light skin for Africa is not a Neanderthal. So, hmm, okay. So this is a montage, some of the images you've seen. This is uh, Tutankhamun and his wife in their garden. The material is gold. The Sphinx and the pyramids. What you can't see because it isn't here in modern times is that all of these, well, you can see in this top one, there's a layer. These were all faced in white limestone, so you could actually see them from hundreds of miles away because they glowed in the sunlight. This is uh, <clears throat> the zodiac that used to be in Dendera. It's now, I believe, in the Louvre because Napoleon dynamited, off, dynamited it off of its dome that it was in Africa. <laughs> so what this is showing you is actually not only the zodiac, but uh, a 365-day calendar. And we'll get into that. In a week or two, I'm going to break that down. Because one of the things that Asante was talking about is you can't have a calendar until you have language. You can't call something a day or a week or a month until you have a way of distinguishing it. But that's not the first thing you do. So that's why he was also suggesting, oh, well, the first science is let's study pregnancy. How do we know what food to eat? How do we know what's optimal? How do we communicate? I knew what was in this montage, so basically this uh, graphic is uh, the Dogon people in Mali, and it's an iron smelting. It's an iron smelter. So it's to smelt something, not the fish. Smelting is basically heating rocks until you, they give up their ore, whatever their ore is. And so Asante is basically saying, okay, you got those three geographic generators, the green Sahara, the rainforest, and uh, what's the third one? Rift Valley. Rift Valley, good, okay. And iron, okay. Iron has a tactical advantage over rocks, it's harder. And he himself makes a, thing, makes a joke about, look, it's not Martians. Let's just say it's us. Right? But where do you get the idea to burn rocks in particular to get a particular metal? It's, two, it's a quarter of a million years long enough to do that? Sure. Without human intervention. I mean, it'll eventually happen at some point. That's Great Zimbabwe, the ancient city from which the country takes its name. Is that the wall on the cover of the book? Uh, no, I think that is uh, Timbuktu. He might identify it, right? I don't know. I think that looks like one of the uh, mosques or the, at the University of uh, Sankor uh, or t at Timbuktu which might have been destroyed by Arab extremists. So, from the Sicily paintings to Great Zimbabwe, let's say the people of al also known as Africa, were no strangers to complex urban civilization, using the current edition of urban, 250,000. 
Europeans reported villages with as many as 100,000 individuals. And before the rise of city-states, 6,000 years might have passed before the raising of the pyramids in Kemet. So any discussion of Africa, of what health means to Africans in America have to start with where we would, where we would begin, where I was taught to begin our healthy roots in pre-colonial Africa. So Africa is a continent, it's not a country, it's a continent where more than 1,800 languages are spoken today. Minimum language capability for any child can be up to five languages and at least three today. So any African students, and I base, this is the African students that I know that are going here, the U of O, they've had at least three. And most often five. We used to have two African uh, educational managers, one in social science, one in math. Between them, they had 17 languages as a normal course of running. Right? So again, think of your average slave. I mean, again, the picture that we have in slave where we had the um, Columbus discovered America narrative. Oh, well, slaves are ignorant. They can't read. It's, no, they uh, came from a place where they had to speak at least three to five languages. And depending on their religion, if they were practicing the original African forms of Christianity, Judaism, or Islam, they're people of the book, which means they're literate, too, as a third of the slaves were Muslim coming to this country, forced to become Christians. Yes? Were there, like, um, were there, like, not, there weren't, like, camps, but, like, they sent a lot of Native American children to civilize them. Did they do uh -huh. that a lot with uh, African Americans as well? Yes. So we were well, born. not camps, exactly. They were, like, they were like schools to civilize these children, like, take them out of their culture. Actually, the, well... <clears throat> If we're talking about, um, well, are we talking about America or are we talking about Africa? Like, well, like in America, they did that. I was just wondering if they did that as well. Like in America, uh, it was often uh, a death sentence for slaves to attempt to read. It was against the law for anyone to teach them how to read. Okay, so after emancipation came, the first schools were schools we started, actually the first public schools in America were schools that black people in cities like New York and Philadelphia created for their children to educate their children. And they allowed white kids to come because there were no public schools at all for anyone. Unless you were rich and you sent your kid to private school. So public school where anybody could come was started by black people. In New York City and uh, Philly, among other places. Any place that you had basic freedom movements. So we didn't necessarily have the boarding school ex 